by far the most interesting learning unit when understanding hazardous materials behavior is the different models that are used to step you through a process in understanding the correct type of response. Because before the 1970s and even well into the 1980s, before the incident command system and a structure was developed, um, fighting the incident was the primary way that people engaged with hazardous materials incidents. So our objectives for today will be for you to understand the salient features um, when you're developing a hazardous materials response plan. And it doesn't mean that you'll be a boots on the ground responder as you see here, but you certainly will be or may be developing all hazard plans as part of, as part of your requirements to fulfill the hazardous communication standard. And then you'll look at classifying the events from the standpoint of the container. And that's what really makes it interesting. Let's not think about me as the responder, but what is this container doing? And this will give us the best decision that we can make. We can kind of align what's happening, what we have, and what type of decision to make when there's a hazardous materials incident. And so the GEBMO, the general model for hazardous materials response was developed by Brenner and he was um, an emergency response um, specialist while at the National Transportation Safety Board and again this is in um, at the same time the incident command system was being developed and so one way to think about the Brenner model and there's really good information in your text it's only three or four pages long is to visualize the movies of how events unfold based on your past experience. So from the original website, which I understand when you look at it, you'll say, oh, this was put up in the early 2000s. And it certainly was, but it was this person's attempt at bringing the different incidents together to help you learn how to decide what to do. So if you've never responded to a hazardous materials incident, you don't know what the next thing can be. But by studying these past experiences, you'd be able to build your repertoire of what could possibly happen in a hazardous materials incident. And this is why that learning unit you have already completed for looking at the chemical safety board, reading through how the incident unfolded and where the mistakes were made, always better in hindsight, will help you um, understand how this model is used. Even though it's a little bit on the older side, it's so straightforward that you can grasp it from an online learning perspective. And I'm kind of speeding through there just so you could see that it's based off of a process. So some event occurs and the container may or may not be breached and then hazardous materials escapes or some energy escapes and where does it go? Does it engulf or does it just go downstream or does it catch on fire? And so what are its targets? What is it looking for? Is it going to linger in the environment? Is it going to be permanent? And then finally, what kind of harm is it going to give the um, people or the environment who are exposed to it? And then the last element is after we think about all that, then what type of emergency response do we put into place? So pretty straightforward, a lot like a decision. Explosion in downtown Los Angeles injured 11 firefighters. The captain said that one significant explosion shook the neighborhood around 6.30 p.m. on Saturday as responders arrived and saw firefighters emerging from the building with burns and other injuries. Some of their uniforms were on fire. Four firefighters were taken to the intensive care unit. Two firefighters were placed on ventilators. Firefighters were initially called called at 327 East Boyd Street in the city's Toy District. The fire department said it was mayhem, which means a firefighter was missing or trapped and characterized it as a major emergency with more than 230 firefighters responding. When the firefighter first when the firefighters first entered the building, there was light smoke to moderate smoke, but things didn't seem right. And then all of a sudden there was a huge explosion and a flash that um, caught some of their coats on fire because they were too close to the hazardous material. 
Finally, they found out that it was butane honey oil, and butane is a flammable gas, and it's used in the manufacture of um, different types of cannabis products. So not knowing what's there can cause great injuries to firefighters, especially if this doesn't have any kind of United Nations code. So before the 1970s, and maybe even in the last example as you saw, the philosophy of firefighters was to attack and ex extinguish, just to cool the tanks, whether that was by using fog um, to capture the vapors, whether it's an inner indirect attack, such as um, a deluge system coming from the ceiling, a direct attack, which would be their um, hoses, or you can have a combination of hoses, a tune line method, or also have, um, like we do a lot in wildfires, we're fighting it from the bottom and we're fighting it from the top. But all of these is simply a combination of attacking. And this is something that we have to step back at and really take a look at what's going on inside the incident. So how do we take a look at that hazardous material? Well, here's where you see we're starting to build these pieces together. So we have to understand the physical properties, how much of the material is there, and what are the occupational exposure limits? That, um, so are there, um, is it really low parts per million which cause um, health effects? If so, then you know it's highly toxic. So something with one part per million is far more toxic than another agent where 50 parts per million would be considered lethal. So what are the occupational exposure limits? And then what is the actual risk to the responders? Because we're going to put the responders um, in that first slot of priority and not necessarily the property or the people who are actually within the emergency. We have to keep our responders safe or they can't go in and save somebody. There's always air monitoring procedures which are put into place, and we learn this um, more in the confined space module. And then let's take a look at our container. What's its integrity? What kind of stress is being applied? Is it heat? Is it cold? Is it um, pressure? And are there already countermeasures in place? So you gotta go back to everything that we've already been looking at. That NIOSH pocket guide is invaluable, especially if you can get the CAS number, the CAS number, off of your safety data sheet. If not, you're stuck with the emergency response guide, which I don't mean you're stuck with, but it doesn't always provide you with as much fidelity as a safety data sheet. And hopefully you can get some placards or markings off of the container, as well as shipping papers if it's rolling. And then what are the proximity of exposures? And here we're looking at both ends. What are our resources available? As well as what's the environment or the location? Can we somehow control that? I mean, sometimes you can um, close an area down to remove some of the oxygen and just let the fire take its course. It's not always the best move, but maybe that would bring the lower explosive limit up so high that there wouldn't be enough oxygen in the room for the um, incident to continue. For example, it was a fire. Or the same thing with solids. Can you um, close off the area to keep the solids from making their way from whatever's being breached into the environment? So this is, in a way, your physical property reference sheet. When you're looking up uh, an agent in from their safety data sheet or the NIOSH pocket guide, um, what is it? Is it an element, a compound, a mixture? Is it in a solution? Is it a slurry? Is it a cryogenic, which means it's really cold? So what state is it in? And what's the temperature of the product where it behaves the best? So the ones that are dark, these are the ones that I always go to. I want to know the vapor density. Is that falling to the ground? Is it falling it into our um, sub-basements? Or are we able to open the windows and let it vent up, right, our vapor density? The same thing as boiling point. Something with a low boiling point is going to go readily to vapor, or it might even sublime, which means that it could get out of hand quite quickly. So these critical temperature and pressures are always important. And then we have the flammability hazards, whether it's a gas or a liquid. The flash point, the flyer, fire point, the auto ignition temperature is a great one. When we reach that, it just... We really can't control the fire at that point. And then what's its flammability range? Um, lower flammability range, so we know where to set our meters, and higher flammability range, which means it's too rich to burn. 
And are there any toxic products of combustion? And I don't have to read through these because you probably already have. You see the reactivity hazards as well as the corrosive hazards. So this pH for corrosivity, is it an acid or a base? Does it react with water or air? These are all important ones that you kind of keep at the top of your head when you're looking at um, hazardous materials that are starting to breach their container. And this slide, instead of having the general properties, the general properties are broken down into, um, it's the, the hazardous properties are broken down by property, right? So a gas is the most dangerous because once it releases its container, it just keeps going. And it could either asphyxiate you because of the agent that's coming out or it displaces oxygen. Um, or it could make you even get dizzy and pass out because it's filling up from the bottom up, right? That'd be something with a high vapor density. So our gases, we're worried about ignition temperature, LEL, UEL, vapor density, and then our flashpoints. Our liquids, here's where we have some toxicity values, but with our liquids, you know, ingestion is usually pretty rare unless it's done by accident or by because of sanitation. Um, same thing with a solid, where you can easily um, ingest a gas if you inhale it deep enough um, when you swallow into your esophagus, it could get into your stomach. And solids, again, um, they're, I like to think of them as less hazardous in the, in, in, when they leave their container. Now, if it's dangerous when wet or dangerous when it hits air, of course, solid could be um, even worse than a liquid. But for the most part, if a solid is not reactive, you're able to contain it. And even though this was covered in a previous module, it can't be covered too many times when we're thinking about the um, flammability limits. So we have a lower flammability limit and an upper flammability limit. And we set our explosive gas meter to what? 10% of the lower flammability limit. And always remember, 1% by volume equals 10,000 parts per million. So flammability does not all, always equal toxicity. Usually something is toxic before it's flammable, but that is not necessarily always true. So we have to make sure we calibrate our meter to a specific gas and to a specific limit and we understand what it is. So when the alarm goes off, we know it's either the flammability alarm or is it the toxicity alarm? So not everything has to catch on fire to have toxic products of combustion. If, a, if an agent such as um, alkali metals are water reactive, when the metal reaches the water, it'll have a combustion and it may give off, as it does, some type of toxic gas. So this is where the um, toxicity of the agent changes as it reaches the environment. And so we're really concerned with, at least when using this model, how is it contained and how is it being breached and whether we can control it or not. So here you'd be going to your green pages in your emergency response guide, because you'd be looking for, again, remember these reactive classes, uh, flammable explosive polymerization, whether it's an oxidizing or a reducing agent, whether it's water air reactive or a radioactive material. And so if you look down the example, a lot of these will make sense to you. These are your VOCs, volatile organic compounds, um, ketones, turpentines, tylenes. We used to call it methyl ethyl nasty. Um, and then you have things that undergo polymerization. So I always think of um, vinyl chloride and styrene or epoxies, right? And epoxy is a really good one. Can you can you could see that if you've ever used an epoxy. Um, our reducing agents are alkali metals. They tend to be water reactive as well. As you can see, they are listed on both of these. Um, many of these are listed on both of the lists. And then lithium is, of course, a reactive metal. And then you have your peroxide agents. And so this puts you in that 5.2 category. And once we have everything we need to know, we're going to remember to look at that separate evacuation zones, those green zones. Most hydrocarbons float on water, so you're able to clean them up this way by diking off the area and using sorbet pads on top. 
Um, spills are typically pretty easy to see if they're on top of the surface as long as it's not an underground storage tank. And here's what I mean by the toxicity level. If you have less than 100 parts per million for your occupational exposure limit, it's considered a high hazard. Where if you're at 10,000 parts per million for your occupational exposure limit, it would be considered a low hazard. And we want to know the state of the material so we could set our evacuation zones. Liquids are easy to see. They're usually easy to see as they move towards us. We're able to stop them unless there's a vapor element that is um, part of the spill. But my, most hydrocarbons are not soluble in water. They're not miscible in water. They float on the surface. And so we can clean them up with this type of um, method. So there are nine stages in this methodology to an emergency response incident. So first we have our normal stays. The gasoline is in its container. And then it's being stressed because a tractor trailer truck has run into the side of the tanker. And it could be reactive or it could just be stressed and then maybe it becomes unstable because you have a runaway crack. The tractor trailer truck that ran into the tanker had heat involved in it and now it's overstressing the tanker itself because it is caught on fire. And then there's this initial injury stage and that's when the accident happens, not necessarily to a person, but it could just be the event itself that the accident occurred. And from there, it's cascading, right? So what happens? Um, is it just a, an explosion? We extinguish it and we're all done? Or does it leak out into the environment? We have to can clean it up over a period of time. And so these are these cascading events. And really, we want to stop. Well, it'd be great if we didn't even have the stress. But before it becomes an unstable, if we can stop the reaction, we're preventing further harm. And then things start to cut back. They start to subside. And finally, we have our restorative phase. And it's all based on um, the environment, the responders, what the material is, and lots of other different elements. But to make this easy, we try to break it down. So the Benner's model is based off of this view of the container. So what is the behavior of the container? And again, this is covered really well in the book, and there's some examples that go along with it. But first, how does the container become stressed? Is it getting heated, thermal? Is it a chemical reaction or mechanical? There's a crack. And then does the material, or when it breaches its container, how does it do that? Is it an all-out runaway spill, or is it just a trickle-down? Or does the container itself disintegrate? So that's when you break a bottle or have a runaway crack. And then how is the matter, matter being released? And that would be a, a violent explosion, such as you had with a BP oil spill. It was A crack was forming because of the stressor, and that was based off of a mechanical stress. It breached its container slowly through cracks, and then it became a runaway, not reaction, but a runaway spill, and it violently ruptured. That was the way the matter was released. And then what's the d danger zone? So where is this material going to go? Is it going to create a stream that flows downhill, or a stream that you can contain, or is it a plume that goes up in the air? or maybe it leaves irregular deposits in the environment. So if you think about the BP oil spill, there were plumes of oil that broke away from the big spill and that created irregular deposits and you had a steady stream. And so how long is this gonna happen? Um, hours, days, weeks? And that would give you the range as in how far this is going to go, like how um, the distance it's gonna travel. So the general hazardous material behavioral model then looks at the harm. So what's the harm from this material being released? Is it a corrosive? Is it an asphyxiant? Or is there some type of thermal exposure? So again, we are the container. So how are we being, um, how can we interrupt this behavior? So the first slide was 
These are our risk assessment prediction clues. We could think about the movie that's going to happen based on our previous experience and what's going on with the container. Now, is there anything we could do? Can we um, redirect it? Um, can we plug it up? Can we just roll the material onto the other side so the crack is facing up? Um, maybe you can um, chill it or vent it, some way to limit the stress levels of the container. And can you um, cap off the breach? Can you position it in a way so that there's a pressure di differential and the material stops leaving the uh, cylinder? Or can we have some kind of zone set up so we might dilute it or set up dikes or ignite it in a controlled manner? Um, once we know our zone, we can provide this evacuation area, our standoff um, zones, as well as shielding. And finally, at the end, we could think about how this material is going to harm us and how we need to protect ourselves during the incident or through decontamination or during decontamination. So here's our events again. Stress, breach, release, engulf, contact or exposure and harm. So is it an applied force or is it an internal force? Have we been breached beyond recovery or can we stop the event right there? Once it's released, what, not only what is coming at you, what form will it take? Will it change forms? What path will it follow? Um, how is it going to engulf the danger zone? And what do you need to do to be able to protect people and the environment and potentially property? And again, hours, months, years, days, weeks, how long is it expected to go? Because that will definitely give us the scope of our hazardous materials response. And then what type of harm will it cause if it's left unchecked? Because we could check this harm along the way. Could neutralize, move people, um, stop the agent potentially in its tracks. And so what's interesting is we usually have this offensive mode. Um, attack it. They're, uh, attack the leaks. Attack the fire um, as quickly as you can. And then you have the defensive mode, which are control tactics. So can you just try to limit the spread somehow? Maybe it's in a secondary containment, which would be a defensive mode. And then you have no intervention, and this is where you take no action at all. And that's because it's believed that there's more harm or more risk to the firefighters or the emergency responders if you if you engage and therefore you just let the incident and the material take its course and this happens a lot with flammable gases and this would be true if you believe that there was going to be a BLEV or Blevy explosion where the boiling liquids cause this internal explosion due to the pressure and we saw that in one of our other slides so again your action plans are um, can you attack it um, can you stand back and let nothing happen? Or did you already have some defensive modes that were already um, in place? And so one way to think about this, I put this together, is um, here we have our offensive mode. Uh, police are trying to stop people from storming the Capitol. And then our defensive mode would be, let's put a whole bunch of um, guards in place so that if people storm the Capitol, we're already there. And then our non-intervention mode is, well, just let them in and do what they do, and maybe that'll be the least amount of harm. So what happens if nothing is done? Maybe here, um, this was far better than um, people being hurt. And I don't mean it in a political way, but it's an easy way to see offense, defense, and non-intervention mode. Sometimes the best thing to do is to do nothing. And so um, this would be the opportunity for you to uh, take a look at the Valdez oil spill, watch the video, and try to do your risk assessment and fill this in as to um, um, what was the stressor on the container and how was it breached? What was the matter of the material that was being released and the zone that it was released into? Um, how long would it be expected that that would be released? And certainly there's calculations when you have a known volume volume. And then what is the harm? And there is really, uh, really difficult to quantify because there is immediate harm and long-term harm. Because we're, if you lived in Valdez, Alaska, you still are feeling the effects of a spill that happened in the 1990s. And so it's really better if you do this on your own, but 
to keep moving through the um, slides, the stressor was mechanical. The uh, Valdez um, ran aground. And so it breached its container by puncture and the material that released was a spill in a stream. And it was, um, the release itself was not um, long lasting, but the exposure is long term because it was toxic to the environment. So you have that short term release, what happens, the toxicity, how we're gonna control it, and then how is it controlled over the long term. And it's really interesting to study releases this way because it gets you right engaged at the level of the release and takes all that emotion out of it. Just break it down in its parts. Stressor container material, engulf zone, uh, impingement, and harm. People are in critical condition this morning after huge explosions at a propane <laughs> plant in Florida. It happened 40 miles northwest of Orlando at the Blue Rhino plant in Tiberias. The blast could be felt miles away. Kala Rama of our Orlando affiliate WKMG is at the scene. Kala, good morning to you. Good morning, Gail. That Blue Rhino plant not far behind me is one of those propane tank exchanges where lots of us go to refill our tanks, the tanks that we all have on our deck or under our grills used so often in the summertime. Well, officials at Blue Rhino tell me that they had 53,000 20 pound tanks on hand before the explosion. A huge explosion tore through the roof of the plant just before 11 on Monday night. Locals describe hearing what sounded like bombs erupting. Jesus. Fire spread from the main plant to tractor trailers parked on site, each loaded with propane gas tanks. As the trailers were engulfed in flames, the cylinders exploded one after the other launching some tanks into the air. Ooh, did you see that? At least two dozen workers were inside the plant. It was Bobby Hudson Pillar's first night on the job when he managed to escape. And I basically heard an explosion and it probably threw me back about three feet. All I could see is everyone just running and I just kind of got up and just ran. Firefighters who responded to the original blast were pulled from the scene for safety reasons. Those living within a mile of the site were evacuated from their homes. Three hours after the first blast, 15 workers on site were reported missing. Our thoughts and prayers are with the families of those who may have perished. But just one hour later came unexpected good news. All of those whom they knew were there tonight have been accounted for. Firefighters are still on scene, and while the fire isn't completely out, it has been contained. We're briefed on an evacuation plan if this were to have happened. At this so how does the material leave its container? You could break the attachment, loss of structural integrity, or uh, breach in the container. Again, this would be uh, mechanical leaking, or here we have because of temperature extremes. How is the incident gonna roll down? And always remember, if you see any kind of deformation in a metal structure that's a pressurized vessel, Right around the weld, there could be places that are much weaker and um, or within the area that was dented itself, the cracks in the material, a gorge or a dent can cause the entire um, unit to lose its structure, structural integ integrity either all at once or slowly over time, depending on the incident. Trying to use the model. You're a wildland firefighter. You see a fire next to a propane tank. Um, how would you categorize this? And then what, is, what steps would you take in addition to identifying the material? So we have a propane tank that's on fire and we're looking at using a model. So the stressor is external thermal. Um, has it been breached yet? Uh, no, so that's great, but if it does, it could be an explosion. Once it releases, will it be a violent explosion, go off into the atmosphere slowly over time? With a propane tank, there would be an explosion and a cloud, and then it would disperse. So this would be short-term exposure. Of course, it could be very dangerous if anybody's close by. And what's the overall harm? Um, well, the explosion, I suppose, can start 
an additional fire, somebody can be close together. But what additional steps would you take after you've categorized the fire situation with the propane tank? Well, there's a bunch of different answers, but um, can you control the scene, warn others, and of course notify the incident commander? You wouldn't want to approach the fire or attack the fire because you're on your own. And a lot of times, again, these attack methods are used with reservation instead of with regret, instead of with aggression, as we've used in the past. So in summary, it's a really interesting model that helps you um, decide on the spot or decide as a predictor before the incident occurs. There's lots of different decision decision making models. This is the model that was in the text. I really like the model because it's straightforward but packed with information. And what I mean by packed with information is um, just taking a look at the initial slide with the model attached to it. It allows you to think about what is happening to the container or the material, how is it going to hurt you, um, when it's released, how far is it going to go and how violently, and what can I do to control it? And we're looking at it from the point of the container. We're looking at the events from the point of the container. What is happening to it and what's the best way to control it? Thank you.